Welcome, everyone. It is so nice to see so many familiar faces pop up on the screen. Hi, Dr. Preston. Hi, <laughs> I'm Maggie. Hello, Maggie. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to everyone. I know there are a few more people kind of entering the waiting room, so we'll give everyone a, a minute to get settled. Um, no, if you not. are on we're MDI right now, you. you are having, a, oh, we're having quite a windstorm here this evening uh, and through the night. So we are hoping the power stays with us. Forgive us if there are any technical glitches. So far, so good, and, and we're hoping our luck continues. Um, but thank you all for joining us. This is our second uh, online Art Meet Science lecture of 2024. We're thrilled to have you all here. Um, we will be recording this evening's lecture and share that link in the coming days. Um, and we are so grateful to Dr. Haller here to share his expertise and his enthusiasm for Albert Durr. I got a sneak peek in the last few days, and I have no doubt you're going to enjoy this lecture. Uh, so we'll turn it over to you, Dr. Haller, and uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you very much, Emily. I'm looking forward to the next hour. Uh, as Emily just mentioned, we have been talking a lot about Albrecht Dürer, and let me share my screen. And here he is. <clears throat> uh, that's Albrecht Dürer uh, in the year 1500. Uh, people knew that 1500 was an important date. Uh, he knew that it was an important date. And I think this self-portrait from 1500 shows how important he found himself. He is displaying himself uh, in the manner of Jesus Christ. One can't deny that. And uh, he's dressed uh, very wealthy. To be honest, dressed like this at that time, if you were not uh, rich enough to afford that, this could bring you to jail. He's looking at, it, at us and Although I'm a bit critical about his hair, I don't know how long he spent every week at the hairdressers, uh, one has to admit it's very impressive. So we'll talk about Albrecht Dürer. And Albrecht Dürer, some of you may not know Albrecht Dürer, most famous painter in Germany, very famous in the Rena uh, Renaissance. Uh, his paintings are not on the art market anymore. And I give you one example why they are not on the art market. Uh, and this is shown in the next slide. So that's a small Dura drawing. It's really only a couple of inches. And uh, this was bought at a yard sale south of Boston uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, it was clearly recognizable as Albrecht Dura. You can see AD. Uh, that's his initials, but it was thought to be a reproduction and they bought it for $30. And four years later, an uh, expert looked at it and discovered that it's a real drawing. But it's a small drawing. It's not one of the more famous things. It's really very small and it's sold for more than 15 million. So <clears throat> I encourage you to watch carefully to understand everything about Albrecht Dürer and the next yard say you go to could make you a fortune. So we'll talk about fever, we'll talk about medicine, we'll talk about the travels of Albrecht Dürer because that's part of his medical history, but also his history. And what I want to talk about also is about science. So when you look at this portrait, you can see that there are two important things beside the hair and besides the dress. And this is the hand, and these are the eyes and the face. And I'd like to convince you that he was very well aware of what he was painting. So you can see the hands, his elegant fingers, they are very important for him, and they should be because he's a painter, he's a craftsman. And at the same time, we have the eyes. 
they're not really piercing eyes. I mean, but they are thoughtful. And the two, the hands on the one hand and the eyes and the brain on the other, this is what was important. And this is what he brought together in his art. So it's about art and science. But we'll start with a medical problem. So this small drawing, which is now in the Kunsthal in Bremen in Germany, uh, it's really this size only. This is most likely from 1523, so 23 years after the painting you have just seen, and he's 28 years old on that. So uh, you add another 23 years, and what it says, what the text says, which is first very old-fashioned in writing, and also very old-fashioned German. It says, when we translated where the yellow spot is, you can see this under the left rib cage, where the yellow spot is and the finger points, I am sore. Now, this is what every doctor likes. You know, I mean, the patient coming in and not describing in complicated words, but having a small drawing, that's the problem. So when we look at this from a medical point of view, we have also his diary and his diary adds to the soreness and it says during the third week after Easter I was very weak and I had terrible headaches. So now we have a sore spot under the left rib cage. This is the left upper abdomen and we have headache and weakness. So what do we what do we make out of this? So the differential diagnosis of pain in the left upper abdomen of a male, so we don't want to make it too complicated, uh, is relatively straightforward. So right upper abdomen would be liver or gallbladder, most likely a gallbladder, left upper abdomen, spleen, colon, and pancreas. So this is not that common that you have a pain and a soreness in the left upper abdomen. Right lower, lower abdomen, it's appendix, uh, left lower abdomen could be colon as well. So left up, upper abdomen leaves us with the spleen. And most likely, because it's a chronic pain, a spleen enlargement, and you can see the long differential diagnosis of spleen enlargement. So we have hematological and lymphatic diseases. We have leukemia, anemia. We have doctors in the audience. So please forgive me if the list is not extensive in your favorite disease is not on that, but we have uh, infections, both acute and chronic, autoimmune disease, long, story, uh, long list. And then we have fever and headache, and uh, most likely it's recurrent because we know this from his diary. So this leaves us now with a question, we need a patient history. So in the next couple of minutes, I'll give you a history of the patient, where he's from, his parents, family history, because this is important, and because we have to think about infections, his travels. He's born in Nuremberg. Now, some of you don't know Albrecht Dürer, and some of you don't know Nuremberg, which was, in the 15th century, one of the most important cities, not only in Germany, but in all of Europe. It was an imperial city, it was the center of the German Renaissance in both arts and science. And this is a colored woodcut by Michael Wohlgemut, Michael Wohlgemut, uh, who was a publisher, famous publisher in Nuremberg. And uh, the print was made by Anton Koberger, who was actually the teacher of Durham. So never before, this is the first engraving of Nuremberg. Never before was your like being printed. So this is where he's from. I told you that it's an imperial city. And here you see the imperial regalia, which were kept for a thousand years in Nuremberg. The imperial crown, the imperial orb, the imperial sword, and you see the coronation mantle. And on the right-hand side, you see a painting which Dürer makes us believe is Charles the Great, but obviously it's an invention, but dressed in the imperial regalia 
And everybody in Nuremberg knew about this, and this is what made the city important and made the inhabitants important. I already mentioned that it was a center of art and science. This is the first artificial cloak after the year 200. So this was made by Martin Beheim in 1490-92. And on the right-hand side, you can see how they constructed this. Actually, uh, these drawings or these paintings are in Utah at the moment at the university. And then they used that and put it on this ball, which is not that large. And they called it Erdapfel, so it's the first cloak. It was done in 1492. And it's obvious this was before Christoph Columbus came back. So on this first cloak, uh, everything which is west of the uh, of Europe in the Atlantic was missing. This shows you portraits by Dürer, and sh this shows you the important man of the high society of Nuremberg. Most importantly, Willibald Pirkheimer on the left-hand side, famous, rich, humanist, and they exchanged letters a lot. And then you see others, serious men, who were running the city and had an important role in the empire. And now, more directly, these are his parents. His father on the uh, right-hand side, Albrecht Dürer, was a goldsmith from Hungary, had traveled extensively in the Netherlands, and then he settled in Nuremberg. And he married, not rich, but from a very old family, Barbara Holper. And they had a lot of children, but Albrecht Dürer first trained with his father as a goldsmith. But then he wanted to become a painter. Before that, I'd like to show you a little bit of Dürer's mother. We don't know about any diseases of his father, but his mother, this is in 1514. That's a drawing by Dürer. And he wrote next to this very moving text. This is my peer's mother. She has born and raised 18 children. She suffered from pestilence, not only once, but more than once in other severe diseases. She was sometimes poor, not in the last years of his life when she was living with him. She was mocked, despised, and sneered. She survived many catastrophes and obstacles, but she was never grumpy, and I cannot praise enough her work and her compassion to everybody. She died, as we can see on this uh, drawing in 1514 on a Tuesday. We could spend half an hour talking about her differential diagnosis, which runs from uh, malnourishment to cancer or thyroid disease, but we'll stick with the sun. And this is the first drawing by Dürer. He was 13 years old. And now you see why he wanted to become a painter. He was brought to him. I mean, he was very self-conscious. I don't know a lot of 13 years old who can do this. And he did this with a silver uh, pen. So this was challenging. And I think this convinced his father. And he sent him to work and to study with Michael Wolgemuth in Nuremberg, one of the more famous painters. And this is what the pupil, what Dürer did. He painted Wolgemuth in 1516. So this was quite some years after he worked there. But he also learned there not only to paint, but Wolgemuth was a printer. He was together, and you've already seen this with Koberger, a book editor. So from a very young age on, Dürer was exposed to the business of making books, and especially, you'll see this in a moment, of printing. So, so far, we have no sign and no explanation why he had this disease. So let's think about his travel. We'll cover two and three and a half travels, and we start 
with immediately after he had finished his training with Koberger, there were years of teaching and traveling and he went to Alsace and to Basel between 1490 and 93. And as you know, this was the rule in Europe after you graduated from your first master, you went abroad and you studied somewhere else. So he wanted to learn printmaking from the masters. He went to uh, meet Anton Schongauer, who was really the master of this new medium. Imagine it's 1490. Prints and printing from engravings is becoming the big business. This is sold on markets. Uh, you can become famous not only by one painting, but by hundreds of prints which are distributed throughout Europe. And this was a business which had just, just started. And Schongauer was one of the big guys on the scene. Unfortunately, when Dürer arrived there, Schongauer had already died at a relatively young age. And you see here one of his famous engravings now at the Cincinnati Art Museum of Christ Christ carrying the cross. He then when after he had studied and looked at all the engravings which his son still had there to Basel, and there he worked with a bookmaker. And this is a very famous book, The Ship of Fools, edited by Sebastian Brandt in the 1490s, and Dürer added woodcuts, and he was involved in the making of this book. But he also learned, and this is a very nice example, that you could print flyers. You could, like we do with the internet, you could communicate events, and this is a famous meteorite near Basel in 1492, and they printed this, there were leaflets out there, there were flyers distributed, some of them were colored, and this led a huge impression of nature and of the wonders of nature in Dura. And even uh, 26 years later, when he did one of his famous engravings, the Melancholia, you, uh, you can still see that the meteorite, the comet of Enzisheim, had an impact. This is a self-portrait, his first in oil, which is now at the Louvre and Paris uh, while he was traveling. It may have been sent uh, to his future wife because while he was away, his parents negotiated for him to marry uh, this person, this is the one drawing we have from him. This is called My Agnes. So he married Agnes in 1494. He not built the house, but moved into this house in Nuremberg, where you can still go. And down below, you can see this is where his shop was. And uh, now it's the Dürer Museum in Nuremberg. But immediately after that, he went off. He had been traveling for three years, and uh, it may have been because of uh, pestilence in Nuremberg, or he just wanted to travel. He went to Italy. So I still consider this years of teaching and traveling, gap years of him. It was a short trip, but for the first time ever, he did watercolors from nature. These are not impressionist watercolors. It's not that he was sitting there, but he was taking notes, I think a couple of brush strokes, and then he worked on these watercolors uh, when he was uh, at home. But nonetheless, these are documents of his travel, the Valley of Kalkroid, which is in Southern Franconia, and then the Brenner Pass and the River Isaac when you enter Italy and you go down towards Venice. We don't know how far he went, but it gives you an impression that this young man not only was a master with his hands, but he was interested in nature. And when you look at what he did during this time, it immediately becomes obvious that uh, he paints in a wonderful way whatever he sees. He wants to grasp nature in his paintings. So this young hair, 
It's uh, a drawing in the, the uh, in Vienna in the Albertina. You can see each individual hair. You can see the colors. It's very artfully done. And the next one is the wing of a blue roller, also in Vienna. Most of uh, his drawings are in Vienna because Imperial Court and uh, they went to Vienna early on. And here you see the same thing. And it's not one animal, it's just one piece of nature which he takes. It's colorful, so it's interesting. But he even goes beyond that. This is very famous, the great piece of turf, also in Vienna. And it's not about flowers. He did this as well. But this is an innocent piece of grass. And uh, he tries to bring nature onto the surface. And he's very proud of that. Only I can do this. This is what he wrote in his diaries. So these hands, he is very proud of. And to be able to mimic nature and to even be better than nature, that's the first steps of his career. He then went back to Nuremberg and then he established himself in Nuremberg. He had to earn money. He wanted to build a family. They never had a child together, but he worked hard. And this is what he looked in 1498. This painting self-portrait is now in the Prado. And it also gives you an impression of what Dura was like. So like all self-portraits, it's about him and himself. When you do a self-portrait, you don't have to mimic something else. You are painting about yourself. And we have still the same face, a bit older. He's still very proud of his hairs, but now it's also very fashionable. You look at the cap, you look at the colors, you see that he must have spent some time uh, with a tailor. You look at the shirt he's wearing, uh, and uh, this is all of the most delicate quality, not to forget the gloves he has, which are of the softest leather. The painting is in the tradition of uh, very advanced Renaissance paintings with the outlook towards uh, nature. And same thing, he's painting their real mountains, and I think this is a memory of his travels to Italy. But he became famous, not only for his paintings, but for his engravings and the prints. This is one of the first books he edited. These were picture books from the book Apocalypse, not Apocalypse Now, the four writers of the Apocalypse. And he not only sold these books at a very high price, but he went to markets, his family, his mother, his wife, went to markets and they sold these prints. And these prints made him famous. You can see Albrecht Dürer, AD, down below here on the four riders of the Apocalypse. And some of you may remember our exhibition, which is still up in MCBI at uh, Mount Desert Island. And we have a modern artist using the four riders of the Apocalypse in a very modern piece of art, which we contrast with our science at the Institute. Another wonderful example of uh, a copper engraving is the Hieronymus. And you can appreciate uh, what a master of engravings Dura was when you look at the texture of the animals, you can differentiate between uh, the lion and the dog. Look at the light, look at the reflections, what you can see on the walls, the shadows and the light, and you can differentiate easily between, between what is wood and what is stone. So to do this, and I'll show you here one example how you do these engravings, you need hands and you need a very good understanding of what you're doing. So it helped 
that he trained as a goldsmith, so he knew how to use these tools, but he was the absolute master in these engravings, and this was accepted all over Europe. This shows you Adam and Eve, and we'll come back to this later on. Uh, and this is also masterfully done. You have Adam standing there with a twig in his hand and a parrot up there. It says, Albertus Durer, Noricum Fachibat in 1504. So this means made in Nuremberg. And you have Eve on the other side with the apple. And then you have animals, and I'll come back to the animals in a couple of minutes there. But, and this is important, now he was not only interested in making these engravings, his interest went beyond that. He wanted to understand what kept this all together. He wanted to understand the proportions. He wanted to understand what's behind the surface, which he so masterfully uh, could do. So he started with uh, working on proportions and uh, he got interested in that as others did. And you know the most famous example, and this is the Vitruvian man of Leonardo da Vinci. So finding the basis of this all, not only depicting nature and mimicking nature as beautifully as possible and as masterfully as possible, but also to understand what's behind it. What are the underlying principles? And this makes him not only an artist, but also a scientist. This is what we actually do is when we do experiments to try to find out what are the mechanisms behind it and what are the rules which regulate, we do mostly molecular and genetic uh, gene interactions and they want you to know what, how is the human body built. So he went back to Italy. That's the second journey we'll look at. He went first to Venice, most likely, as you can see here, he was in Bologna. You will talk about this in a minute. And perhaps he went to Rome, but we have no documentation of that. So Venice at the time, Nuremberg was important in Germany, one of the major cities in Germany, but uh, Venice beat it all. Venice uh, on the crossroads between the Orient and Europe, everything which was coming in from the East, from India, from China, went through Venice. So there was a lot of richness, there was a lot of culture, and you can see how lively it was, and you can see paintings on the left-hand side. You see Titian, the Assumption, then the Frari Church, one of the largest paintings which were made at that time. And then on the right-hand side, you see where the merchants from Germany, where all the Germans met. And this is the Fondaco dei Tedeschi. This is where the German foundations in Venice was. And this is where it went. One of the reasons he went there, and in the middle you see the Doge of uh, Venice, that's a wonderful painting by Giovanni Bellini, and Giovanni Bellini at that time was the most famous painter, and Duro was very happy that Bellini not only acknowledged him as uh, an artist, but praised, especially his engravings a lot. But he first went there, very modern, because of copyright problems. His engravings were so popular and they were so expensive that other painters, other engravers actually used this AD, Albert Durer, and used it in their prints and sold them for more money. And he was furious about that. He was always interested in money, as we'll see. He needed to earn money. And uh, he wrote in one of his books, which you have seen, <clears throat> If you copy this without my permission, and this is the first text about copyright ever, if you copy this without my permission, you will lose all your property at court. So I warn you, don't do it. Interestingly, one of the engravers in Italy who had stolen his monogram, his very famous 
in its own right. And uh, that's uh, the engraver you can see on the right-hand side. He was the engraver of Ravel. His name is Raimondi, and Raimondi couldn't resist using AD in his own engravings to make them more expensive. So Dürer went there, he went to court, he won in Venice, which is not easy to win at court in Italy when you're coming from Turin. So that was one reason he went there. Here you can see the difference in uh, clothing between Nuremberg, that's on the right-hand side, and Venice, and Venice was very elegant. It's also famous or infamous that more than 11,000 prostitutes were living uh, in Venice at that time, so it was a fashionable city. You see a famous Torcione, which was painted around the same time, and so this tells you what the artistic scenery was like. And Dürer wrote letters, which is very interesting. So uh, he exchanged letters with his friend Willibald Perkheimer. Willibald had actually studied in Padua. So he liked Italy a lot and he encouraged Dürer to stay. He wanted him to buy books. He wanted him to buy jewelry. So we have a very rich uh, combination of letters. And you can see here Venice, April the 2nd, Everybody is very supportive and I'm highly estimated. Most of the other painters in Venice are cellos. And then he was cellos of the other painters and he wanted to make paintings there as well. And then August the 18th, same year, I've quieted all those who said I'm mostly an engraver. Now they all talk about the beautiful colors I'm using and that they have never seen more beautiful. And this is the painting he made for the Fondaco dei Tedeschi, which I've shown you. This is the so-called Rosenkranz altar, which is now in the National Gallery in Prague. You can easily see how impressed they were by the colors uh, Dürer used in this wonderful painting. And then he wrote October the 13th, 1506, I plan to leave in 10 days. Before that, I will go to Bologna to meet somebody who can teach me the secrets of perspectiva. Here, I'm a gentleman. That's a famous sentence in his letters. At home, I feel like a nobody. So he went to Bologna. And this, or these, are the people he met in Bologna. That's a painting by Jacopo Barberi, he is Italian. He worked for a while in Nuremberg, 10 years before. He also worked in Dresden in uh, Saxonia, where he was hired. And he supposedly knew all the secrets about perspective and about geometry, but he had learned it from the scientist, and this is Luca Pacioli. Luca Pacioli had edited and written the first books on arithmetics, first for uh, scientists, but then also for painters. And here you can see very nicely, on the one hand, he has a book open, which is Euclid, and he's doing geometry on the uh, left-hand side of this. He's wearing uh, the cape because he's thinking and he looks at this wonderful crystal cube, which is of a, a complicated structure, and you can see other structures nearby. The red book is his own book, which he had just written. So he met most likely with uh, Dürer and he introduced him to his way of thinking about geometry and about the basis of painting. This shows you his book, Summa de Arithmetica Geometra, uh, Geometra Proportioni and proportionalità. I can't even pronounce that. Uh, and it was uh, 1487, 1494 when it was edited. What's very interesting, these geometric figures, and here you can see quite a few of them, they were made by Leonardo da Vinci. So Luca Pacioli and Leonardo, they were together at the court uh, in Milan. 
They had serious discussions. We have documents about that, about painting, about uh, geometry, about the secrets of perspective. And this is what Dura learned there. And you can still see eight years later, one of his most famous engravings, the Melancholia, where he has all these geometric forms there. The ball you can see here, the complicated geometric structure and tools for that. And the angel brooding about all these problems, scientific problems, uh, as a painter. When he came back to Germany, when he came back to Nuremberg, he still was very active with engravings and with paintings, not so much paintings, to be honest, but more engravings, and he was working on geometry. And then basically for the next 15 years, he was editing and working on two books. One treatise on measurement, which was just before he died, uh, sold in Nuremberg. A uh, very nice title in Germany, Unterweisung der Messung mit dem Zirkel und Richtscheid in Linien, Ebenen, in ganzen Korporen. Very old-fashioned Germany, but you can see that he became a scientist. This is also from the same book. So he, were, he was teaching methods how to use this in practice. So it's not only a very learned book, but it's also a very practical book. It's basically like a textbook we have in cell biology, which tells you exactly how to do your experiments, not only explaining the cell biology of what you're doing, but also giving you advice how to set up your experiment. So this shows you the title page of that, and you can appreciate how wonderfully this was made. And it was not only for painters, but also for goldsmiths, sculptors, stonemasons, carpenters, and all those for whom using measurement is useful. As I said, he became a scientist. And the second book is the book on proportions, including uh, the four books of human proportions. And this is what he was interested in there. He wanted to analyze his own paintings, and he wanted to use this analysis for better paintings. And you can see this here in the, the book Proportions, what he did in there. So this was a lot of learned geometry, and then he applied it to human proportions. You can see how near this is to what Leonardo did with the Vitruvian man, where we have only one example. And this by Dürer is much more detailed. So he's not only trying to surpass everybody with colors and with engravings, but also with uh, his science. Very detailed work, work for more than 10 years, how to proportion the human body and how to find the rules which determine. He did this for males and females. He did this for children and for grown-ups. He did this for small and for large. He worked very hard to find the mathematical rules. You can see how diligently he worked on symmetry. Another wonderful example of the measurements and here you can see very elegantly how modern this all is when you try to construct these human bodies and it almost looks like computer art. And this is the second part. These are the eyes and this is the brain. And as I said in the beginning, Dürer knew very early on that he could do both, that he could do the me mechanistic part that he was very gifted and talented, but at the same time, you use your brain, you use your eyes, and you can see how proud he was of himself. So this reminds us we still have a problem. We still don't know where the yellow spot is and the finger points, I'm sore, what this all means. We have one journey open.
This is the journey to the Netherlands in 1520, 21. He went to Aachen, Antwerp, and to Zealand. And the reason for this trip was money again. You know, the one reason to go to uh, Italy was uh, the copyright issue. And now he was traveling there because uh, he had been giving a stipend, which ironically the emperor had asked the city of Nuremberg to pay every year. And this was a significant amount of money he received from the imperial court. But then Maximilian I died and this stipend had to be renewed. And for that, he had to talk to the next emperor. And this is why he went to the Netherlands. But at the same time, when he first went to Italy, he was not famous, not to the extent like in 2021. This was like a triumph where every city he came to, he was honored by the city councils and by all the painters there. He was invited by the rich, the noble. He had a wonderful time. He wrote it all down in his diary, what he spent, what he received, and he received quite a lot. So it was a wonderful, successful journey. And he went to be at the coronation of Charles V. And this is a quote. This was the biggest social event of the century. So this was the emperor ruling the world. And interestingly, he was financed by Jakob Fugger, also painting by Dürer. So you can see that he painted the rich and the famous. And he financed the emperor in his election because the emperor had to be elected by the archdukes of Germany. And they had to be bribed because his, the other possible uh, emperor was Francois I of France. So in order to make this, uh, he overrode to Fugger half of the empire. And the empire was huge. This shows you the empire of Charles V. He said, the sun never sets in my empire. And you can see on the right-hand side, Europe and Everything which is not blue or green belonged to Charles V, and he was the emperor of that. And on the left-hand side, you see what they call the New World. So this is all of California. This is all of Mexico. This is Florida. This is a large part of the South, and all the way down to Peru and on the Brazilian coast. So this was what made his income, all the gold which came from the new world, and a large part of this went to Fugger for this coronation, as I said, the biggest social event of the century. This shows you, made at the time, the entrance during the coronation, and even 300 years later, this is a painting from, excuse me, 1878, not 1978, by Hans von Mackert, which is now in the Kunsthalle in Hamburg. This is what the 19th century thought of the triumph and the entry of Charles V in Antwerp. And you can see a lot of 19th century thoughts, what empress did at the time. But nonetheless, it was a huge event. And Dürer still had the eye of an artist. This is the port of Antwerp, a drawing he made during that time. On the left-hand side, you see his wife. That's a silver drawing, 1521, what she looked when she dressed as a Dutch lady. But he also had made a drawing of Katharina. Katharina was a slave, a servant working in one of the Portuguese merchants' homes. So he filled his books. He gave away drawings and paintings during the trip. You see one example, he made a drawing of uh, a very old man, 93 years old, with uh, whom he saw in Antwerp. And then he made a painting and he gave this painting to the Portuguese merchant 
all during his trip. And then, despite all the activities he had with the court and all that, uh, he went to the sea. This is the only drawing we have from this trip. Originally, he wanted to go to see a whale. He had heard in Antwerp that there was a whale, a beached whale on the coast of the Netherlands, and he wanted to see this because we have already seen he was very much interested in nature. So he went from Antwerp, you can see this on this old map, to Sealand, which is on the coast of what is now Belgium, which is quite a trip just to see a whale because a huge animal, nobody has painted or drawn this before, so he wanted to see this. So a whale had been sighted in Sealand in April of 1521. He went there, but he didn't find a whale, but he got a fever. So he was infected there. You can see this here. He wrote, in the third week after Easter, I was seized by a hot fever, great weakness, nausea, and headache. And before, when I was in Sealand, a strange sickness came over me, such as I've never heard from any man, and I still have this sickness. And we can see from his diary that it came back recurrently over the next couple of years. So what this means, fevers with a periodicity, whether it's tertian or quartan, are highly suggestive of malaria. And we know this not only from Germany, but from Chaucer and Shakespeare. In this area of the world, on both sides of the channel, the ague, as they called it, was very common. So how likely is it that he actually got malaria? When we look at the symptoms of malaria, and this is from a textbook, as you can see, we have fatigue, we have a high fever, we have headaches, and we have the enlargement of the spleen. We don't know, well, he mentioned nausea, so we could include this as well. We can't do any lab tests. So I'm not telling you that he has the disease, but to be honest, with this history and this symptoms, I would make this a very high, uh, this would be very high on my list of differential diagnosis. And then we look at the vectors for malaria. And this shows you the geographical distribution of three important malaria vectors at that time. And you can see that we have three types of mosquitoes uh, for the disease. And the one in red is Anopheles atroparvus. We have then in green, Labrantia, which is more serious, more aggressive and Saharovi in Greece, but nonetheless, the red dots all indicate where mosquitoes were highly prevalent. And uh, when I did research for this study, it was very interesting to find out that, for instance, on the British coast, uh, Greece never lived in their parishes when they were near the coast because they knew that there were too many mosquitoes and the smell was terrible. So this is where Dero got his disease, and this just reminds you that uh, we have a cycle uh, of the sporocytes in the mosquitoes themselves, and then we have a cycle in the liver, and then last or least on the right hand lower side, we have a cycle in erythrocytes, and you get the fever when the erythrocytes rupture and the uh, shitsons are released in the blood, you have immediately a fever reaction, then you have a reinfection, and this is how the circle runs, and this is what uh, Dürer most likely brought home with him from this trip. I want to finish briefly the last couple of minutes to talk a little bit about what did Dürer's doctor actually think. And the reason I'm interested in that is not only because I'm a medical doctor and I want to compare notes with my colleague in Nuremberg, but uh, what was, when we were uh, talking about Dürer and how he wanted to understand nature, we don't have a lot of understanding how he looked at nature. We can only look at his drawings and his paintings. We understand much more 
that he was interested in the science of his art, and we have talked about this uh, a little bit. But what did his doctor think in terms of disease? Durer only reflected on the symptoms. And what, he do what his doctor did when a patient walks in, his frame, his mind frame are the four humors. You have heard about that, but you may not be aware that this is a concept which goes far beyond medicine. It's old. It was really developed by Aristotle and it was further developed by Hippocrates. But as you can see here, we have four humors. But when you look more closely, we have the four elements. So it's fire, water, air, and earth. It's related to age. It's related to humors, but also to the year. So fall, summer, and winter, and spring are associated with these four humors. And last but not least, it's associated with character, how people behave, and with what people do. So for me as a medical doctor, this is a very interesting concept because it's very individualized medicine. You may first think, well, the four humors, that's a ridiculous way of uh, assuming how the world works, but we are still thinking along these lines. So it's not tissues, cells, and genes, but it's organs and the balance of humor factors in the individual patient. And you may not be astonished that a Harvard professor in 1997, neurology actually said, well, let's go back to this old concept because when I measure brain waves using these categories, I get clear phenotypes. So this is what the doctor would have used as a frame of mind to characterize the disease. And Dura had the same mind frame when he did other things. This is the last painting. It's a very large painting. It's in Munich in the Alte Pinakothek, and these are the four apostles. It has a lot of religious meaning also because Dura gave it to the city of Nuremberg for free about six months after the city had converted the whole city to Protestantism. So you're aware that 1518, Martin Luther and Durer was uh, a progressive and he was for Protestantism. So he painted this, but it's not only the four, event, uh, the four apostles, but it's also the four humans. You can see very clearly St. John the Evangelist, sanguine on the left-hand side in the front. You see the phlegmatic St. Peter. You see uh, St. Paul the genius, so melancholy was always associated with brains and with genius, and you see the choleric, more Leonin, St. Mark. So this frame of mind was so important in the 16th century that we can find it when we look more carefully in Dura before. You remember we talked about the uh, Adam and Eve, which he did in 1504, and uh, there are humors on this painting or on this engraving. And these are the animals. And the story is that these humors were totally in balance in paradise and only when they shared the apple, then it all got out of balance. And I'm, whoop, I'm missing one here. So I have to explain this using words. You have animals there, you have the cat, and the cat is sanguine. Uh, sorry, the cat is uh, leonin. So it will catch the mouse and eat the mouse. So it's, uh, uh, then we have the hare in the background. And this is sanguine, uh, a lot of sex. And then we have the elk. And we have the ox, and the ox is phlegmatic, and the elk is the symbol of melancholy. So I think this is not only talking about these engravings, it also gives you a 
view on what the frame of mind was for Durer or his doctor. And it reminds us when we look at our science that this is not self-evident, that we have to ask ourselves, what's our frame of mind when we do genes and we do cells and we do tissue? And with that, I'd like to finish. I'd like to finish with his most famous piece of art. In art history, no engraving, no painting has been more written about than this melancholia from Dürer. It's so full of symbols. It's so full of unexplained meaning. And you have seen a little bit of what it meant for Dürer. You have seen the comet I talked about. You have seen the geometric structures we have here. We have talked about art, so you can see the tools down there. We have talked about mathematics, and you can see the magic <clears throat> rectangle right behind this angel. But despite all this, time is running, and I leave it to you what state of mind the angel is in. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Heller. That was fantastic. You never cease to amaze me. I, 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 even with a background in art history and having been through exams on these pieces, I learned something new every time. Um, that was phenomenal. Thank you so much. Uh, does any, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and you can ask a question directly or use the chat function, raise your hand. Uh, we would be Happy to take a few questions if you have any. Herman, hi. Uh, this is Dave Dawson. Yeah, um, that was brilliant, by the way. Um, feeling dunk, feeling dunk. I wonder, uh, since um, Durer traveled uh, to uh, the Netherlands, did he uh, implement any of the uh, sort of optical gadgets? that the Flemish painters uh, used, you know, to um, <clears throat> understand and <clears throat> correct for perspective and that sort of thing? Yeah, uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, the instruments they use in the Netherlands, uh, especially for perspective and for camera obscura and things like that, is a little bit later. We don't know whether mm -hmm. that early in the 16th century, it was already used, you know, the lenses, the first uh, microscopes mm -hmm. that was all uh, developed around 1580. So it's about 70 years later than when Dürer traveled there. I think he used some of the techniques and you can see this uh, in one of his books. If I go very briefly back, you can see this here, you yes. know. The, yes. The, green which is in between which then helps <clears throat> to make these uh, paintings more perspective i think he used that so that was in use in nuremberg and in the netherlands yeah. it may be that uh, he learned more things but we have no documentation of that yeah great thank you herman i have a question can you hear me yes, yes. yeah this is andrew trotter uh, it seems like um in this era and Durer and also the the doctor that you discussed were uh, working, they're trying to establish ideals, idealized categories uh, that whether it's the body showing how they uh, geometric, pure geometry would be uh, help shape the body or uh, the that uh, diagram of the humors uh, would uh, sort of break out everything. But um, and this was getting breaking. Uh, this was an advance on, you know, believing in magic and in um, other uh, earlier kinds of way of analyzing, you know, human ills or the human body. But now we're sort of getting, you know, in this day we are getting toward back to kind of holistic, uh, holistically looking at the body and looking at ambiguities again, embracing ambiguities that some. Um, kinds of uh, immune uh, immu immune problems and other things that are they're they're much more they're much less clear than what they seem to be going for. 
Uh, do you, do you agree with this? And and was this uh, you know was this like a, a one swing of the pendulum and then it, it's maybe coming back the other way? Yeah. Well, these are all fascinating questions. Uh, first of all, uh, the the four humors are not as clear cut. You know, it's not like you have four options for your patients. It was always a balance. So you have a little bit of that, you have a little bit of that. And then it was the art of the doctor to find out how to combine this in order to come up with the diagnosis and then also with treatment strategies for that. And uh, so uh, this is one part, but the other question is really, what is the frame of mind for us? And uh, we think in terms of genes and uh, we think in terms of master genes and other genes which are regulated by these. So we have hierarchies of genes. You mentioned immunology. I mean, one of our uh, mind frames is that we have B cells in T cells, and that we have humoral immunity. <clears throat> so at the moment, we have three parts of that, and we are playing around with all sorts of very small scale research, how to combine all this. But we always come back to the question, is it T cells, or is it B cells, or is it humoral factors? So the frame of mind, I think, it's not that we don't understand more in a way, and we have more successes practically with medicine, but to understand the framework, and I'm almost sure that in 200 years, B and T cells will be not irrelevant, but people will smile a little bit and said, well, I, they didn't get the point. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I, I give you one example about humors. Um, I'm a nephrologist, and I have seen Susan Ferris on the call. There is, there, when we have patients with certain immunological problems, which we don't understand, one way to treat this is we take out all the serum and we replace it with what we think is better serum. Very old fashioned, but it's still done all over the world. When you asked us, what are you actually doing there? We don't, but it's in the guidelines, certain diseases we treat like this. So there is still some relationship to 1500. You know, <laughs> Herman, one might look at um, the science around long COVID. Uh, and that's about the state of the art uh, right now, if you follow it. Uh, it's not much beyond the uh, four humors. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, what we need, one, I think one thing we can agree upon is that you need individualized medicine. You really have to listen to the patient. Mm -hmm. And we did this with Durer. You know, we were going through all these travels just to find out the last travel uh, if he wouldn't have gone to Sealand, he could have lived for another 40 years uh, and become 93, but he wanted to see the whale, mosquito. You have to look into patient histories and you have to do individualized medicine. Herman, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Emily, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Dave, we can hear you. I just wanted to show you, I can't see my picture on the screen for some reason, but we have a Dura print. Can you see that? Wonderful. Very oh. nice. I should have used this one. I would have. We've had that, we've had that for about 60 years. In fact, Very we good. have two. We have the rabbit. We have the the, the uh, hair also, but I can't find it. We moved in a new place and I can't find it. But we, we love Dura prints. So, David, what you should do is, you know, the owl you have just shown us. Have a closer look. Perhaps it's worth 15 million. I don't think so. That would be very nice. <laughs> you could donate it to but, the. But file. thank you very much for for, our, for the talk. It's fantastic. Thank yes. you. Thank you. It is it is fantastic. I, I can't tell you how much we enjoy them, Dr. Heller. So thank you. And while this may be our our last uh, online lecture for the winter season, 
in March and April for our Star Point Society members, we will be returning to some in-person museum tours, both in Washington, D.C. and in New York City. We'll be sending out details in the coming days. Um, we have an exhibition that will be opening on campus in uh, probably early June, which we're looking forward to sharing with you when you are back in Salisbury Cove. And we hope to return to some additional online lectures this fall. So thank you for joining us. Uh, this program is made possible by the support of our Star Point Society members, and we so appreciate that. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you uh, soon. Thank Thanks, you. Emily. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you.